trust those climate models. They're already fixed to give the exact answer you're looking for. And even then they're always wrong, right? No, climate models are not just a simple equation that says if carbon dioxide goes up by X, then the Earth's temperature goes up by Y. Nor are they a bunch of statistics that are just fixed to give us scientists the answer we want so we can keep getting our government grants. If you want to know more about where all that grant money goes, check out our episode that answers the question, is climate change just a money grab? No, climate models are actually based on physics. And it's not really new physics either. As we talk about in our episode on how long we've known about climate change, the basic concepts we use to understand how our planet works and how we're affecting it date back to the 1800s. Modern climate models got their start in the 1950s when a couple of physicists wondered, can we program a computer using punch cards because that's how they did it back then to reproduce how water and air moves through our atmosphere and oceans using nothing more than the fundamental physical equations? It turns out the answer is yes. The reason why we have things like Hadley cells in the atmosphere and Gulf streams in the ocean is because of the basic physics that governs the behavior of fluids. The same physics holds true everywhere from our little planet to the other side of the universe. Climate models have come a long way since those early days. That's because to get a truly accurate picture of our entire climate system, we have to account for a lot of factors, not just the circulation of the atmosphere and the ocean. We need to understand how different types of land cover affect their environment, how natural cycles like El Nino influence rainfall around the world, and how carbon and nitrogen and other important substances cycle through our atmosphere and our ocean and the biosphere. Computer modeling allows us to simulate these processes by taking the world and dividing it up into finer and finer grids. Global models today now take into account most of the major factors known to affect climate over timescales of days to centuries. These include changes in energy from the sun, volcanic eruptions, the effect of different types of clouds and particles in the atmosphere, the influence of forests and fields, water and ice at the Earth's surface, heat exchange between different parts of the climate system, and of course, how humans affect the environment as well. Today, global climate models, or GCMs, are among the most time-intensive and complicated pieces of computer code on the planet. That's not to say climate models are perfect. Of course not. People who build and run them would be the first to say so. The Earth's climate system is incredibly complex. To perfectly model it, we would need to know everything about every process, large or small, that occurs or even could occur on Earth. So our models are limited by our knowledge. There are many things that we don't fully understand yet, and likely some that we don't even know about yet. That's why those of us who work with models, like me, constantly compare them to historical records, to paleoclimate data, and even to conditions on other planets like Venus or Mars. Sometimes these comparisons actually help us find errors in the data. A classic example is when early temperature trends in the lower atmosphere measured by satellites did not agree with what the models were saying. Many logically assumed that the models were at fault. But satellite data is complicated. You don't just read the temperature off a thermometer. It requires thousands of lines of code to get the correct information out of a satellite. And in this case, when the numbers were recalculated, it turned out it was actually the satellite data that had errors. The original analysis was not accounting for important factors, like how the lower atmosphere data was being contaminated by the upper atmosphere data, and the drift of the satellite's orbit over time. As it turned out, the models were closer to truth than the original data had been. More often though, these comparisons do identify ways that the models fall short and can be improved. One recent example is sea level rise. Scientists who were studying conditions in the distant past, when the Earth was a similar temperature to today, were puzzled by the fact that there was a lot less ice on Antarctica and Greenland back then. This led them to investigate the mechanisms that caused the ice sheets to fracture and eventually melt. They were able to identify a new mechanism we didn't know about before, ice cliff instability. 
Once this one was factored into the models, the possible upper bound on sea level rise this century increased significantly. So in this case, by comparing models with paleoclimate data, it was clear that the models were systematically underestimating possible change. One of the most frequent accusations we climate scientists get is that we're alarmists. We are constantly exaggerating the worst case scenario and our models help us do it. A few years ago, some researchers decided to test this. They collected projections and studies and assessments that have been published over the last two decades, and they compared them to what really happened over the exact same time frame. Now, I expected them to find that in some cases we were too high, in other cases we were too low, but overall we came out just about even. And that is what we do see in terms of predicting the changes in global temperature over the last few decades. When you look at old model projections from the 1970s and you compare them to the changes that really happened, they were pretty much right on. But that is not what the researchers found when it came to other ways climate was changing. It turns out that scientists are biased, but in the direction of being too conservative. We have a tendency to underestimate the amount or the speed of change. This tendency is so systematic that the researchers coined a name for it, ESLD, or erring on the side of least drama. Now that we know this, we can be a little more careful with what we say. The most recent climate report that I helped write, the fourth US National Climate Assessment, concludes this, paraphrasing just a bit. While climate models do incorporate the important processes that are well understood, they don't include all the processes that we don't understand well enough yet, but that we know could lead to big changes. Because of this, our models are more likely to under rather than overestimate the amount of long-term future change. What's the bottom line? Climate models aren't perfect, but the myth that they always overestimate global temperature change is just that, a myth. The reality is that they're the best tool we have to figure out how the Earth's climate will respond to this unprecedented experiment we're conducting with the only home that we have. We need to understand what we're doing if we're to have any hope of avoiding the most serious and even dangerous consequences of our actions. Thanks for watching Global Weirding. This episode was brought to you in part by Citizens Climate Lobby. If you have any questions about climate versus weather, let us know during one of our Facebook Live Q&As. And please be sure to check out globalweirdingseries.com for more episodes. See you next time.